From recording engineer, to record producer, to label executive, to headphone magnate, to streaming gladiator, Jimmy Iovine changed the music we listened to and then changed how we listen to music. This is his blueprint. Early on, you did not excel in school and in fact got fired from your first couple jobs. Mm -hmm. At a certain point though, something changes inside you and all of a sudden, the work as an engineer starts to stick. What happened? I had a lot of insecurities and a lot of fear. And I was one of those guys like, oh man, I hope they don't hit the ball to me, you know? <laughs> when I got to the studio, although I got fired from my first two jobs, what I found is that I clicked with the owners. I've had a lot of relationships over the years that when I connect with certain people, I can get something done. They asked me to come in on uh, Easter Sunday in 1973 to answer the phones. I'm Italian, I'm Catholic, I'm from Brooklyn. My mother thought it was a bad idea, but I went anyway. I was like, I'll do anything. And what they were doing was just testing me, which is really kind of funny in a way. As a 22, 23 year old, you end up in the studio with guys like Springsteen, who was on his way to being very established. That's right. John Lennon, who was at the top of his game. How did you create that connection and how did you establish credibility with those people? You're there to help make their project better. And part of that is caring as much about their music as they do. I just said, if these people are allowing me in this room, I'm gonna do as much as I can to be of service to them. That's what it was built on. To be honest with you, I wouldn't let record companies down to my studio. I feel that when you're making music, that if you play it through someone, in the process of it being made, no matter what that person does, if that person doesn't react, reacts great, or reacts poorly, it confuses the artist. When you started working with Tom Petty, you framed sort of the success of the record in terms of money, in terms of this is gonna buy you another car or yeah. buy a house. At you thought the rappers invented it. Well, <laughs> at what point, you know, you, you started as like a fan of music? I started out as a fan of music and my father was a longshoreman. I wasn't cool, so I wanted to be cool. I wanted to have a better life, so I wanted money. And um, I didn't want to be a longshoreman. You know, it's that, it's that simple. And I just, uh, so when I saw Tom, I said <laughs> immediately when he played me those songs, I said, man, we're gonna be rich. <laughs> so at, at that point, like, how much of an understanding of how the business of music worked did you have? Very little. I knew that one thing, I was getting paid by the hour, and in my new job, I was getting paid a royalty. When you're dealing with artists, you have to sort of navigate their supreme confidence and also their supreme insecurity. How do you deliver honest feedback without spinning them out of their mojo? Your job is to be honest, that's why you're there. Now, I don't do it with a sledgehammer. You have to be truthful. If somebody plays me a song that I think is not as good as it could be or should be, doesn't mean that I'm right. It just means that's, that's how I feel. And you have to say it, because if you don't say it, then what, what are you doing there? You are notorious for your phone calls and long phone conversations with your artists. What was the significance of that correspondence? As a producer, you have a responsibility to understand the person's record you're making because to understand what they're trying to get out. And uh, I would spend a lot of time on the phone after the sessions, whether it be Stevie Nicks, Tom Petty, Patty, you know, whatever, I would just spend a lot of time. In managing these artists, drugs and substance abuse were something that a lot of them used to fuel their creativity and it took them to the top. And then a number of them had, you know, tough periods. What was your philosophy in dealing with that? Well, see, one, I'm a producer and a friend, right? I do everything I possibly can. But what I've learned when you get older and it happens close to you and it happens around you enough, you realize that these people are responsible for their own sobriety and their own lives. You could just do so much. And unless they want to fix it, it's not getting fixed. As you became more successful and your reputation preceded you, how did you decide what artists you wanted to work with and, what you, and who you would turn away? I would always go by stuff that I really liked, that I felt I could help, you know, or do, or contribute. 
there's a lot of different ways to do it, but you try to stay in music where you have a feel for it so you're not just lost. Like that goes in the story when I, when I produced Foghat. That wasn't my kind of music. They were great. I wasn't even good yet. And I screwed that up. I got fired from that too. <laughs> Is there a single record or song that you look back and you think that that is sort of the high watermark of your career as a producer? Well, there's nothing like your first hit, you know? And Because the Night by Patti Smith was an incredible moment. It changed my life. That one song changed my life. Jimmy enjoyed meteoric success producing records, but as the Brooklyn native aged, his interest in studio life waned and he pivoted, utilizing his golden ear and ability to coach artists as an executive instead. As you make the transition in late 80s, early 90s from being a producer to being a label executive, did you have the feeling that you had sort of scratched all creative itches at that point or what was the motivation? I felt that I wasn't natural in the studio anymore. In the 70s and the early 80s, I was the same age as the artists making the records. As I started to get older, around 37 or 38, I started to feel like <laughs> music is changing, younger, you know, and then you become a producer and the record label, a and or whatever, they don't want to bring you in because they don't have as much influence on the record when you're in there. And then I had a son and I was ended up coming, the sessions in those days were 12 to 14 hours. So I was never seeing my new son. And then David Geffen just sold his record company. And I said to myself, well, you know, I said, he kind of does the same thing I do, uh, but he's making a lot more money. Maybe I could go home at night. Right? So those are the things that went into it. <laughs> Nothing more complicated than that. When you started Interscope, did you have sort of a specific space in mind that you were going to fill, that you saw that there was an opportunity? Yes. We wanted to feel like Atlantic in 1970, Atlantic Records, where they had Ray Charles, Aretha Franklin, Led Zeppelin, and the Rolling Stones. And we wanted our company to feel like that. We felt we got there. You know, we had Nine Inch Nails, we had Marilyn Manson. We had Pac, Snoop, and Dre in the first three years, which was pretty good. Got yeah. us in trouble. <laughs> was it, well, was that by design? Of or? course not. Are you kidding? Again, I come from a place where the artists get to do exactly what they want and no compromise. I'm not going to sit down there and tell uh, Tupac or uh, Trent Reznor, uh, you know, why don't you change the lyrics or change that or change this? Because like, I think that whole that's all a bunch of bullshit. You know, we did whatever felt exciting. In the mid '90s, death row <laughs> at their height, East-West war is going on, and you are a man in his mid '40s going to movie premieres with bulletproof vest on. How did you rationalize that to yourself or to your family? First of all. Death Row owned their own company. From day one, I said, we're making a deal with Death Row where they own the masters. It meant a lot to me that they owned their masters. So I made a deal like that with them. Remember, they weren't robbing banks. They weren't selling drugs. They were legitimate businessmen. They were just got involved in violence, which is maddening, but it made no sense. What could anybody do? What? Talk to them. I, had, I used to have the guys over my house all the time, saying, this is nuts. But some of them didn't have the tools to handle the success. At Interscope, from 1990 to, say, 2005, you guys basically just soared and soared and soared and soared. And around 2005, some of the marquee artists cooled off a little bit, and it seemed like your attention started to wander. Well, what happened to me was Napster. And I didn't like the way the record industry was handling it. I just decided to build something else, you know, around music. I wanted to build businesses with our artists. And that's how Beats got started. What part of building that business did you find creatively fulfilling? Well, it's very simple. Dre and I both felt that headphones sounded sterile. We wanted it to sound exciting. So we said, if we make a headphone where the design is beautiful and we make them cool enough, and we market them like they're either Guns N' Roses or Snoop Dogg or Tupac. I said, I think that'll work. And that's what we did. So that's what was creative. 
was created was developing an entire new market. Bose was looking at headphones like, okay, go to sleep on a plane. We were looking at it as motivation. We were looking at it as emotion. And we wanted to sell something that would get you off your ass. You've had to be very flexible throughout your career and transition from one thing to another. What do you think has been the thing that has allowed you to do that? I like to pivot. I was always somebody like that because, like, look at a great DJ. What makes him great is he gets bored before the audience and he changes the song, <laughs> right? <laughs> Looks like a magician, right? He goes, oh, good, good, I'm so glad that song changed. I get complacent and bored. I got bored of producing records. I got bored of running a record company. I wanted to move on. Jimmy foresaw the disruption that technology would bring to the music industry. But when his longtime partners balked at his proposed solution, Jimmy found new ones willing to break the mold and embrace the future of music with him. When you started Beats, what was your exit strategy from day one? Had you e even considered that something I, like that? I was always obsessed with streaming music from 1999. We had a company called Jimmy and Doug's Farm Club, a TV show. That was supposed to be a streaming service. You know, then we partnered with Sony and you couldn't get the deals done. It just was impossible. That's why when I met Steve Jobs in ADQ, I said, these are the only guys that can get this done. They, know, they understand it, they can get it done. They're behind the artist, they're behind copyright. And otherwise we are gonna be making, trying to make these deals between the labels for a very long time. Apple Music is fairly different from your other endeavors, right? It's a product that is aiming for ubiquity and it's trying to, to reach everyone. How do you think about running that business differently? Well, again, Trent Reznor and I got together on Beats Music because we had a similar vision, felt there was a lot missing. We didn't want the distribution of music to be left just in the hands of technology companies. We saw it as a new art form of like, wait, okay, let's create something that moves. But unless the streaming services become literally of service and they make your life that much better, more interesting, it won't scale. When you looked at, you know, the competitive landscape, whether it's Pandora or Spotify, like, what did you feel like they were missing in terms of I felt, I felt like when we got into it, they felt like utilities. These things need to live more like music companies. I mean, iTunes was an incredible thing that Steve and those guys came up with. But I always felt streaming needed to be something different than that. What does success at Apple Music look like? First of all, great is success. We want it to be great and unique and new. We're working every day to get there. So that's one form of success when artists can work freely on it and the labels can interface with it when they have to. And, you know, it, there's a lot needs to be done. The other thing is we just closed our second year and we're, you know, somewhere around 30 million people. So that's pretty good. So success is both those things because if we do the first one right, the second one will come. It seems like everyone is hurting, the artists, the streaming services and the labels. The economics aren't working for any of them. What do you think is the single biggest thing that has to be changed in order to make that work for all three? Labels need to get more sophisticated in tech. You're kind of banking on everything staying the same. Only the technology companies are moving at 100 miles an hour. When you're inside a tech company, you realize how many years out they are planning. In the short run, if you want this thing to grow faster, somebody's got to deal with free because it's being taken advantage of right now. The artists are suffering. Their artists are getting killed in this thing. For example, the Billboard chart is weighted where a stream on YouTube is weighted the same as a stream on Apple Music Pay or Spotify Pay. To me, who's a record maker, that sounds like fake news. And the labels and Billboard, uh, they say they're gonna get it right, but they need to fix that because that causes the artist to promote themselves to free tears and it's counterproductive that that has to get fixed. Do you think, you know, as the distribution has been democratized and also fractured because of the internet, we'll ever see artists of the same size as Eminem in 2002 or 50? Well, I, I, I believe so. I think people like, for example, Adele, she takes off a year two years, three years to make an album, to write it, produce it, make sure it's exactly right. Kendrick Lamar stopped everything else and made the album. 
You can hear it when they do it. A lot of things are working against creativity and it's stunting musical growth. The industry needs to do those little things to not, you gotta be careful with creativity or else you'll go into a, a dark period in music. You just, it, it's capable. You're capable, of, uh, it doesn't all, all have to be the renaissance of music. You know, you can go into a part where music gets very sterile. Then it'll get brought back up again. So you, you always run the risk of that. That's my fear. You've obviously achieved pretty much everything that anyone could want to achieve, both in terms of your legacy and also monetarily. What is it that makes you get up in the morning and go into the Beats office? Well, because I made a promise. I promised Tim and Eddie that I would do everything I could to make Apple Music successful, and I'm gonna do that. And then at some point, you know, I'm not young anymore. I'm, you know, I'm 64 years old, you know, I'll see what happens. But right now, I'm committed to those guys and that company and to the people that work at Apple Music and to the artists that gave me a break when I was a kid to try to help get this right. And you still enjoy it? I don't know if I ever enjoyed it. It's, it, it's work to me. I look at it as work. Me personally, what I have to do to get something done is physical and emotional to me. When you say, am I having fun? I mean, am I, am I having as much fun as in the Malfi Coast on Italy on my friend's boat? No. <laughs> but I'm, I enjoy my work, but it's work. When you look back at your career, is there a single through line that has propelled all of the successes? Yeah, turning fear into a tailwind instead of a headwind. Fear is as powerful as the force. And if you can harness it, what an asset because people that can't harness it, you're gonna have a big, big advantage. And that goes for anybody from six to 60. You just, you figure out how to do that and harness that fear, it's powerful. And that's, it's very simple. That's been my whole thing. When I feel fear, I've trained myself to move forward. What's the thing that you're afraid of? Well, first of all, anyone who does something that turns out really well, if you're, if you're a creative person, you're afraid the next thing's not gonna be as good. And the fight's never over with fear. You know, it pop up something that you didn't realize you were afraid of. Then you have kids and you're, you're afraid of something else. And so it's never gone. It's just, you've gotta harness it. Are there missteps or moments of regret? I don't have a rear view mirror. I really don't. This is the first time I've ever looked back on anything. With a rearview mirror, they ain't taking victory laps. And those are a waste of time to me. You know, I'm like, let's go. What's new? What's tomorrow? That's what I was always about. So I made a lot of mistakes. Who doesn't? But I don't care about the mistakes. I care about the overall thing. And while you're making them, you learn by them and you move on. I don't look at life like that. You know, I took the rearview mirror out of my car in a long time ago. <laughs>